By 2050, one in six people in the world will be over the age 65. 2021, seniors 60 years and older outnumbered children under five. By 2050, 80% of seniors will live in low- and middle-income countries. Adapting health and social systems to this demographic shift is a major challenge globally. We believe it is everyone's responsibility to provide solutions for the social determinants of health. We are motivated by a deep sense that these issues can have immense consequences on individuals, families, communities, and society as a whole. We're mission-driven. Join us on the Boomer Living Broadcast for episodes of full information, inspiration, and advice for seniors. Our expert panelists will discuss topics like senior health care, dementia, caregiving, technology for seniors, and affordable senior living options. This podcast is your guide. And here is your host, Han Brown. Hi, I'm Han Brown, the host of the Boomer Living Broadcast, and on the show, industry leaders share inspiration, information, and advice for those who care for seniors. Our expert panelists discuss senior health care, dementia, caregiving technology for seniors, and affordable senior living options, all of which address the social determinants of health. So thank you so much for participating in the conversation. So check out the CareString, our recently launched platform where we match seniors with caregivers to guide businesses and their employees through the caregiving journey for their loved ones. So please check out CareString. Now, for those in the audience, we love to hear from you. So please comment below if you have any questions, and we're very glad that you're here. So today's topic is Parkinson's disease. Is it a paradigm of aging? Parkinson's disease is a neurodegenerative disorder that is rapidly overtaking Alzheimer's disease as the most common. It's a progressive disorder of the nervous system that affects movement and can lead to tremors, slowness of movement, stiffness in the limbs and trunk, balance problems, and difficulties walking. There is no cure for this disease, but there are many ways to manage it. Parkinson's disease has many problems for our society, from caregiver stress to hospitalization costs, but our understanding of genetics and environmental causes is slowly upgrading them to the level of diseases, a much needed step towards precision medicine. Precision medicine offers the hope of tailored treatments for each individual. Rather than a one-size-fits-all approach, we hope that by increasing our understanding of Parkinson's disease, we can create better treatments and hopefully one day a cure. So join me today in conversation is Dr. Alfonso Fasano, Professor of Medicine, Neurology, University of Toronto. Dr. Alfonso is a renowned and award-winning neurologist, scientist, and a researcher. He's published over 180 papers in peer-reviewed international journals including the prestigious New England Journal of Medicine. He joined Toronto Western Hospital's Movement Disorder Center, where he co-directs the surgical program for movement disorders. Dr. Fasano's main interest is pathophysiology, studying how problems with brain function can lead to changes in behavior or other symptoms, which he pursues through his research on Parkinson's disease. He's currently leading several clinical trials to better understand Parkinson's disease and improve treatments. So, Dr. Alfonso, welcome to the show. Can you hear me right? Yeah. Okay. And, uh, well, that's a great honor for me to be on your show on this program. And uh, I think it, what you're doing is really useful to uh, patients and, importantly, family and the public opinion in general because uh, clearly there is a need to uh, understand what we're talking about the, the general knowledge of these conditions need to be uh, improved otherwise we're all uh, uh, at mercy of what's happening on in the internet and the wrong information that very often are out there uh, they are just uh, misleading uh, patients and families so mm -hmm. thanks for what you're doing and thanks for inviting me Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. 
And of course, Parkinson's and Alzheimer's happen in the later part of life, but we also know that it can happen early in life. So the title may be a little misleading, but it, it can happen all range of life, right? And since um, our scope is for the seniors, I think it's important that we learn, we educate, and put the information in the forefront and do what we can to hopefully defer it or prevent it. So thank you. Thank you for your work. Thank you, Mark. So um, I guess to bring everybody on the same page, what is Parkinson's and what is your perspective on the future of Parkinson's? Yeah, so actually you beautifully summarized uh, what Parkinson's is and the future in the introduction of the, of the podcast. Uh, uh, we should start by saying that even though we call it Parkinson's disease, uh, we should call it Parkinson's diseases. Uh, it's a plural or even better Parkinson's syndrome. Parkinson's is the first doctor uh, who, from London who at some point uh, a couple of centuries ago recognized that few patients had, actually five patients, he described five patients had certain features. He called it shake, shaking palsy, uh, which is a little bit of an uh, interesting um, combination of uh, words because shaking means movement, excessive movements, but at the same time palsy, so lack of movement and actually captured what this disease is. It's the combination of involuntary movements, and we can talk more about it. And more importantly, what doctors called bradykinesia, which means slowness of movement, as you said. And actually it's bradykinesia what really affects people's quality of life because tremor may be embarrassing, but it's not the major problem. The major problem here is that people can't move well. So this is in a nutshell, the description of what the disease is. And obviously there's a lot of emphasis on the motor feature of this condition, uh, as you mentioned already in the, in the introduction, but it's now recognized that uh, Parkinson's disease includes a variety of non-motor problems. And actually these non-motor problems are more often the major driver or, or, or drivers of a poor quality of life. So if you have time, we can talk more about it. So but go, but going back to what I was saying before, it is a syndrome. A syndrome indicates in medicine a number of signs and symptoms, and that can be caused by a variety of reasons. Uh, that's why we need to acknowledge right from the beginning of this podcast that this is a very heterogeneous condition. Um, yeah, we can use the term condition. Uh, we can use the term diseases. We can use the term syndrome, but it's well recognized now that Parkinson's disease is not a single thing. And it took a while to get there. And this explains why so far we didn't have a cure. Uh, and we'll, I'm sure we'll talk more about it uh, in, in, you know, during this in, in conversation. Uh, but you asked me about the future of this uh, condition right from the start. And I'm telling you that the future uh, will start with recognizing at each individual um, uh, level why that particular subject developed Parkinson's disease. And from that, we will finally have a personalized treatment, followed by hopefully very soon a precision medicine approach. Personalized treatment means that you take into account the features of the patient and then you adjust the treatment based on what you see. But precision medicine is really driven by biomarkers, genetic conditions, um, what we call the exposome. So what happened to the person's life, uh, environmental factors. And based on that, you can tell, okay, this patient has this, 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 and that. This is why Parkinson's developed. And because of this, we need to address the problem with this particular strategy or therapy or medications or surgical treatment. So this is precision medicine. And it's not just, um, uh, you know, science fiction. It might be at the moment for Parkinson's, unfortunately, but uh, in many conditions like uh, oncology. In oncology, as we know, uh, often uh, the, the, the tumor can be characterized so well at the molecular level because of the uh, uh, sample that uh, the surgeon obtains during surgery, for instance, that we know now what's the gene that caused the problem, what's the mutation that pro caused the problem. And depending on what is found, then the oncologist will adopt different paradigms, different approaches. So the same should apply, uh, should happen hopefully soon to any diseases, to any disease, including Parkinson's. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you now, how will Parkinson's affect someone's life physically and mentally? Yeah, so uh, I should say that uh, obviously I've been seen uh, thousands of, of, of patients uh, with Parkinson's or if you want, you can call it uh, uh, 
people with Parkinson's. There's a little bit of debate of what's the best way to call them. Being Italian, I like the term patient because it comes from a Latin word, which has a lot of meanings. Uh, but um, uh, having seen many patients, I can say that uh, um, regardless of where they're from, uh, obviously I've been practicing in different countries, and regardless of their socioeconomic status, their beliefs, their religion, their family support or, or, or what, regardless of all of this, the disease affects uh, each individual to some extent in a very similar fashion. The most and per perhaps most disabling part is dealing with the diagnosis. Knowing that you have a chronic condition doesn't help. Knowing that you have a condition with no cure doesn't help. But it's not just that. Hearing that name, Parkinson's, carries a lot of stigma. So often, most of the time I spend, that I spend with my patients is discussing the diagnosis of what it really means. Uh, and for years and years, the major problem that some of my patients have is not the motor problems or the no motor problems I was telling you about, but it's really uh, uh, coming to the conclusion that yes, they have something they need to live with and accepting that. Uh, and it takes a lot of time, a lot of resources. And probably as physicians, we don't spend enough time discussing the psychological implications of being diagnosed with a chronic disease with such a terrible name. Um, I should also say that there's a lot of mis misinformation as we discussed uh, before on this condition. A lot of people don't even know what they're talking about, yet they think they know because they heard about this a lot of time. Sometimes they get confused between Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. Sometimes they think, oh, I'm gonna be in a wheelchair in five years or I'm gonna die soon. So instead, reality is very different and we can talk more about it if you want. Sure, sure. So what are some techniques for managing stress when living with Parkinson's disease, let's say pastimes or, or medications now? Yeah, so managing stress uh, starts from uh, understanding what's going on uh, to have a sense of uh, uh, of um, uh, a sort of a, an awareness uh, of uh, of what's going on with their body and with their mind and side effects of medications. But more importantly, really, uh, is um, being able to connect with their doctors, with their care providers. And it's not just a doctor business here. We need psychologists, neuropsychologists, psychiatrists, nutritionists. There's a really a variety of people that should be taking care of uh, people with Parkinson's. Uh, because it's a really systemic disorder that affects from constipation to urination to pain. There are many things that happen to someone with Parkinson's and yet it's not always the same. So every person is different. Uh, and this connection uh, is not just with care providers, but it's also with peer, with peer patients. And the, one of the positives of the pandemic, and I think there are many uh, in the end, and one day we'll be having this uh, clear in our mind, is that these emphasize the need of connecting to others, to other human beings. And social media is actually quite useful. Uh, I'm pretty amazed by the ability of patients to create a network. Uh, just to mention one, PD Avengers, on, on, you can find them on Twitter, on their website. And this is really more than just a support group. Actually, if anything, these are patients supporting doctors. They're supporting research. They're giving us ideas. At the Western, at Toronto Western, my hospital, we are, we are very proud to have a patient advisory board. So patients are no longer ob, ob, an, an object of research or Taking, taken care of by a doctor. Patients are really active part of a team and that helps managing the stress because they, for the first time, realize that they have a hand on the disease. They can really make a positive impact uh, helping others. That also give them some, some sense of, uh, of uh, uh, being uh, in charge of what they're doing in their life. Uh, and, uh, and often people with an early diagnosis, as I mentioned before, are quite stressed and what I do is making sure that they connect with other patients who went through the same. Like I said, we are all humans. We all go through the same thing the same way. And this sense of connection, this helping each other really validate their, their scope in life and in a way validate the fact that they have a disease. Because at the end of the day, everybody's going to have a chronic disease. The way you deal with it makes the difference. Yeah. You know, everything that you're describing, in my opinion, uh, what a blessing to have uh, of access to the available uh, support system, right? Because I think years ago, you know, like I mentioned to you before the show, I painfully go through the journey of caregiving with dementia and now seeing family members taking care of another family member with Parkinson's. 
you feel very alone and less than, and even maybe embarrassed, right? Who's going to put themselves out there and saying that, you know, you're going through this journey. But I think it's great that we can tap into social media and tap into conversations like this to give hope and to give people um, knowledge, because I think knowledge is very empowering. So I thank you for sharing this, your work on this platform. Oh, my pleasure, as I said already. Uh, on the topic of embarrassment, uh, yes, absolutely. Um, but there's very little to be embarrassed here. Um, the, uh, uh, I always talk about a, a dear patient of mine. His name is Benjamin Stetcher, and he has a, a blog. It's called Tomorrow Edition. He's a young Parkinson's disease patient. And he, one of the first things he did, actually, was telling the world that he has Parkinson's. There is nothing to be embarrassed uh, uh, by and and then um about and 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 it's actually inspiring a lot of other patients to come up and and tell the world what's happening to their to them and uh, and, and this is actually creating a, a very positive uh, environment for future patients to be able to openly share what's happening to them uh, again i've seen many patients and some of these patients thankfully don't have any visible sign right they you can tell that they have a problem Yet they're very in very in a lot of distress because they spend their day and their life trying to hide their condition. This mm -hmm. is particularly the case for people who are still working and they don't want their co-workers to know. And that causes a lot of problems because they are they spend the day with this fear that someone is going to see a little bit of tremor. And who cares? Mm -hmm. Everybody shakes. Mm -hmm. So most of what I do is basically telling them that they need to accept what's going on and being open about it. Obviously, I can't do more than that because at the end of the day, it's a personal decision, but I'm absolutely sure that the more people try to hide what they have, the more stress they, they go through. Uh, and so and there's no reason to do all of this. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, I think, you know, conversations like this, I hope to magnify the message uh, that regardless of the uh, physical, mental condition that you're in, uh, illnesses that you might be facing with. Sure, it, uh, it's declining, but there is life in the decline. And, and that's what I hope out of this conversation. Yeah, as I said already, there are, uh, thankfully, a lot of therapies. None of them is a cure, as we know, uh, but they are doing an amazing job. Obviously, not everybody responds the same way. Uh, I mentioned right from the start how heterogeneous this condition is. And therefore, yes, the same medication might be, work beautifully for one person, not so much for another one, or in another one might actually worsen things. Uh, it's a trial and error because we don't have good biomarker. We don't have a precision medicine approach, as we discussed already. Yet we have good therapies, uh, starting from drugs to uh, intervention, but even physiotherapy, aerobic exercise, Mediterranean diets, a good lifestyle. All of these have a profound effect on the disease. Uh, and people don't die from Parkinson's anymore. They can live, I've seen patients who are living with Parkinson's for up to 40 years. And this was considered to be impossible in the past. Uh, we say these are no cure. Well, before we had levodopa, people with Parkinson's would die on average after nine years. Now, if you die from Parkinson's nine years into the disease, it means that you didn't have Parkinson's in the first place. It was mm -hmm. something else. Uh, and, and this is because of levodopa, a simple drug um, discovered almost by chance many years ago has profoundly changed the natural history of the disease. So yeah, it's not a cure, but uh, in a way it's close to a cure because people live a lot longer. Now, quantity of life is not exactly as quality of life. And we recognize that. Uh, and, and that's why most of the research now is trying to manage what's not responsive to levodopa. You mentioned balance disorder. Balance doesn't necessarily improve with levodopa. And, and, and this becomes a big problem for a patient at some point. And with balance problems, you may have a, a fall and a fracture. And from a fracture, you may end up, end up in hospital and maybe with a complication. And this might eventually lead to a death. Um, so reason why we need to focus on what's not at the moment managed well with drugs or surgical intervention or physiotherapy or all the other uh, interventions I mentioned before. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you, you answer this some degree, but I want to ask you, like, are there uh, tips on how to get rid of the depression from dealing with this debilitating chronic illness? 
Absolutely. So there are, um, uh, I, will, I will divide my answer in two different layers. One is the psychosocial adaptation I was talking about before, being part of a support group, trying support, trying to, to find resources. Uh, and we discussed already how, how good are social media in this regard. Social media can, uh, uh, can be source of a lot of stress, a lot of misinformation, a lot of misbelief, a lot of bad things. Uh, but also they can, they can really be useful. Um, being, having a very good care partner makes a difference. Um, I've seen the huge difference uh, in people's life when they have a chronic disease and a caring care partner versus when they're alone or even worse with the wrong care partner who doesn't really care, even though we call it care partner. Uh, so this is the first layer. The second layer is more biological. Because people need to realize that depression is part of the disease. It's an expression of the, of the disease. And now it's not the classic depression. It's not that feeling of sadness. It's the, not that melancholic feeling of everything is black. Everything doesn't, doesn't have purpose. I want to kill myself. I cry. In Parkinson's, depression has different uh, flavors. It's more on the apathetic side. People don't have motivation to want to do things. Uh, they have anhedonia. Anhedonia means lack of pleasure. Uh, they don't have any um, uh, uh, positive reinforcement from going for a walk, from exercising, because that doesn't give them back anything in terms of pleasure. And, and humans do only what causes pleasure. Uh, so this is more biologically related to the disease. And it really taps into the deficiency of dop uh, dopaminergic terminals in the brain. So lack of dopamine. Um, often Parkinson's patients are prescribed with antidepressants, but very rarely they make the difference. They might do, the, uh, uh, they might make the difference if there is a real depression. But if we're talking more about this apathetic uh, syndrome that I was telling you about, uh, lack of motivation, these patients don't do well until they receive enough dopamine. Uh, and to, uh, just as a corollary to what I'm saying, there are some patients who only fluctuate in terms of no motor problems. So fluctuations are the ups and downs of symptoms in Parkinson's. Most of the time, the fluctuations are motor fluctuations, meaning that the patient takes the medication, does well, then the medication wears off and the tremor comes back. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there is no tremor coming back. There is sadness coming back. There is depression just for a couple of hours or anxiety, even a panic attack. So this clearly tells us that Instead of giving them antidepressant, anxiolytics, we just need to give them what they need, which is dopamine. Uh, and they will, this will take care of motor and no motor problems. Sometimes we overdo this, and this explains why some of the patients medicated by doctors might have excessive seeking pleasure, um, uh, like you know, going for shopping or hypersexuality or eating too much. So this is exactly a pendulum that swings the other direction. Exactly like if we use too much medication, also from a motor perspective, people may move too much. So they swing from not moving enough to having something we call dyskinesia, which is, which is basically excessive movement, like a dance. The same occurs from a behavioral standpoint, but a depressed patient, a depressed, but in reality it's more an apathetic, uh, uh, anhedonic patient needs dopamine. And if too much dopamine is, is given, then they will become more addicted to pleasure, more, you know, into uh, the opposite spectrum of the problem. Yeah, I, as you're speaking, I'm just thinking, um, I painfully witness um, a family member when he has the right medication or balance of medication, and when he doesn't, it's just everything that you just described. And it, it, it's... It's um, it's tough. It's tough because you can go like this, and then you can go down like this. Yeah, in it, a it, it, it used to be tough. Uh, I mean, it is still tough. But the good news is that we have good therapy to take care of these ups and downs. Uh, there are pumps that can give uh, uh, levodopa constantly. Uh, there is a brain stimulation that stimulates the brain at, at always the same way, day and night. So we, research has done really big steps in, in, in improving these ups and downs. It used to be a big problem many years ago. It still is a big problem for people who can't have access to these advanced therapies, who can't afford these uh, uh, advanced therapies, which, which are, of course, more expensive. Uh, not every country has access to all of them. Uh, so there's still a lot to do in terms of uh, 
disparity to access to treatments. Uh, in countries like Canada, where I practice, we're lucky enough that um, all patients have basically access to all the advanced therapies. Um, uh, we can do them all, uh, which doesn't necessarily mean that every person can get them, uh, because sometimes it's the, the person is simply too frail to get through them. Um, the other day, I saw a 76-year-old patient, very smart individual, with a lot of tremor, not responding to medications. And usually these patients do well with brain stimulation. Deep brain stimulation is one of the things they do. He's 76, though, and it's a little dangerous now. So that's the other reason why education is so important. Uh, I'm not saying that now everybody needs to rush and get DBS as soon as possible, because later on it won't be possible. But people need to know the complexity of the decision behind any uh, treatment selection. And, and not all the things we do uh, treat everything. And more importantly, some of the things we do to help certain problems might bring on others. So you might go for a procedure to help your tremor, the tremor goes away, but your speech worsens, your balance worsens. Mm -hmm. So it's always a delicate balance uh, between deciding what to do. But to your point, this ups and down has a lot of therapies now, thankfully. That's great. That's great. I want to take a moment, uh, just a pause and acknowledge our guests. You want to? Oh, wow. Okay. So do you see the comments here from which one do you want to take here? Okay. Let me see if I can see them. Oh, yeah. Okay. So there are, uh, I can try to, to answer uh to them one after the other maybe uh, very uh very quickly so do you have any option on the use of virtual reality technology to measure outcome and improve motion by emotional issue movement is medicine absolutely movement is medicine and uh, virtual reality is something that we currently use in our gates lab um th th this is a way to really make powerful rehabilitation because uh that's also come from neuroscience research uh, we have something called mirror movements uh, we have techniques like motor imagery. So we know that when we think about something, actually the brain does that. If I think about eating, the area in charge of moving my hand to bring the fork to my to my mouth will activate, even if I'm not doing it, simply thinking about it. If I see someone doing something, the area that do the same activity will activate in my brain. So this combined with virtual reality really makes the whole thing more powerful. It creates a, a more widespread activation of the networks uh, in charge of these activities in the brain and certainly makes things better. Uh, so Benjamin, who is the patient I was telling you about, th he thanks me for mentioning him. Unfortunately, I need to go now. Okay, but I'll, I'll, it needs to, he, he would love to hear my thoughts on whether or not PDs, plural, should be synonymous with aging and why or why not. Well, we can address this right from here. PD is not a, uh, the same as aging, but with aging, you may have PD or PD-like uh, signs. It's being called mild Parkinsonian signs of elderly. Um, this is not saying that everybody's gonna have them. It's not saying that, oh yeah, it's normal. No, it means that there's some pathological changes in the brain that just by chance, or simply giving enough time to the brain to develop them, you see. Uh, and uh, uh, a lot needs to be done here. I always say that the easiest Parkinson's to cure one day will be the young onset Parkinson's because the younger the person, the stronger the effect of a single gene. And if you have a single gene that we can treat uh, because we know what's the missing part, then you in a way at least uh, uh, take care of that problem and, you, and, and then the disease at least doesn't worsen. But Parkinson's of the late stage, not late stage, of the late age, is more of a multifactorial problem coming from genes, environment, what happened to you, trauma, stress, uh, if you smoked, if you didn't. So I always say that treating this Parkinson's, that late onset Parkinson's disease, means treating aging. And I think it's so difficult. Uh, we will be all, all uh, um, you know, living until you know, 200, 250 years, and this is not possible at the moment. We can talk about it if we have time, uh, but let's make sure that people understand that we are not saying that Parkinson's is caused by aging. We are not saying that any aged person will develop Parkinson's. Uh, the paradigm of aging is still a good title, I think, for, for this, this uh, um, episode today. Uh, because like I said, treating late onset Parkinson's disease will mean having a handle uh, on what aging really is and improving it. 
uh, Larry is saying the issue of connection is important across other neurodegenerative diseases too. Absolutely, this is uh, uh, we're learning from Parkinson's, but the same applies to many other other conditions. Absolutely, uh, there's a great idea uh, that is a great idea, and it works well for those with dementia. Uh, Michael is saying, probably referring to something we were talking about before. Uh, Loretta is saying, love the idea of connecting new patients after diagnosis with those who have been through it. Absolutely. We, we, those, do, those patients do a great job. They help me a great deal. <clears throat> We're doing the same or trying to do the same for people receiving deep brain stimulation. And often people who are considering deep brain stimulation or any other therapy, they want to talk with someone like them who went through the same process and got the therapy. And I try to help them, but I always say the same thing, though. Say, look, I can make you talk to someone who had the therapy and had a great improvement. And if so, you want to have surgery the next day. Or I can make you talk with someone who did the therapy and maybe had a side effects or didn't improve as much as they expected to. And then you don't want to have the therapy. So I want to emphasize that I have some power in steering them towards accepting or unaccepting the condition. Because we need to acknowledge that everybody's different. Everybody responds to different degrees. So I still favor this, this type of connection. Uh, but we all, always need to keep in mind that everybody's different. Uh, Michael saying, can photobiomodulation therapy helmet help in any way or any other type of technology? Interesting question. Actually, I came across this video a few days ago. It was sent to me by a dear, uh, dear friend. I think you're referring to a research going on in, in, in Australia. And in short, the answer is no. Uh, yet you see great results on videos. You see patients putting this helmet on and they can move. But I can tell you there are patients that smoke marijuana, they improve. There are patients that put their feet in a special device and they move much better. The big problem, uh, and actually I tweeted about it, is placebo. Uh, Parkinson's patients are extremely sensitive to placebo. There is research showing from years ago that when we are experiencing placebo, we just have a boost of dopamine in our brain. So it's a biological effect. So anything that you see online make sure that there is a study that is placebo control plus and randomized and double blind what 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 is this meaning i'm going to explain placebo control means that a group of patients will receive the sugar pill the fake therapy randomized means that there is no way we can pick which one is going to get the real therapy and which one is going to get the placebo so that is really by chance double blind means that neither the patient nor the doctor knows what's what's the uh, treatment allocation Many people think that this has been a guinea pig, but it's actually the way science moves forward. And without it, we are not able to make any claim about efficacy because being humans, we are all uh, uh, at, at the mercy of placebo, doctors included. If I give you a medication, I hope that you do better. And, and so I might be biased. I might think you're doing better even if you are not. So science moves forward with these type of studies. And I think doctors are not doing a good job in explaining what these terms are and why this is needed, why it's needed to have studies uh, enrolling many patients or enrolling minorities. This is a big problem in the States, for example, there are not enough Latinos in studies or not enough women sometimes in studies. So it's important to talk to patients, to their family, so they understand the value of being part of research because this will help them and future patients. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, Okay, so I think we're done for now. Yeah, yeah, I think we're good. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, I think now you're off once. Okay, I'm gonna fix this. Hang on here. Meanwhile, I saw that there are other questions that uh, okay. were posted. Okay, we, we know sure we we're not, them. yeah, we know we're not the, the, the names here, but let's move <laughs> forward. I don't of know. Course. The love I'm honored to be Han. I'm actually honored. I, I'm honored to be you as well. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So the next question I have is that, is there any evidence 
um, that demonstrates that genetics increase the risk for developing Parkinson's? Uh, the question is whether there are uh, evidence um, that there are certain things increasing the risk of Parkinson's? Um, or? If there's any evidence demonstrates that genetics oh, yeah. in, increase it's... the risk of developing Parkinson's. Uh, yes, uh, there's a lot of evidence. Um, uh, and actually, this taps into one of the comments I was reading before. So as I said before, the younger the age at onset, the stronger the effect of genetics. Uh, but it's always a combination. We know this from twin studies. Twin have the same genetic background, yet one might have the disease, the other one might not. Because it's always the very complex interplay between genes and the environment. Now, while we can easily, easily uh, quote it, uh, assess genetic backgrounds because DNA is that it doesn't really change too much. Actually, it should not be changing, even though people might talk about post transitional uh, transitional changes. But anyways, I don't want to be too technical. But just to simplify, DNA is there; it doesn't change. We can assess it at any moment in life. Environment is complicated. How can we make sure that the person has been exposed to a toxin, even if we don't know the toxin, or how we can tell? How can we tell if uh, someone uh, smoked too much if he wasn't the smoker, but there was a smoker in the family or the other way around. So it's very difficult to really have an handle of what the environment makes uh, to, to the, uh, how the environment contributes to, 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 to the disease in the end. We have some data, however. So in terms of genes, uh, we know, generally speaking, that having a family member with Parkinson's increases the risk, generally speaking, uh, that someone else in the family will have Parkinson's disease. And this risk is obviously greater uh, depending on the age at onset of the disease. Uh, this makes sense because the younger the person in the family, the higher the risk for someone else in the family. But we have genes now. We know that there are genes causing the disease. Uh, and it's funny because the very first gene causing Parkinson's, uh, which is the gene that led to the discovery of alpha-synuclein, is the gene encoding for a protein called alpha-synuclein. Uh, was discovered in a town which is basically half an hour away from my hometown in Italy. It's called Condursi. Uh, and it was discovered by uh, uh, an American group, uh, was there, uh, went there, and, uh, and this was in the 90s. And before this, there was no evidence that genes were actually playing a role in Parkinson's. There were people at conferences arguing whether Parkinson's was genetic or not. And many people back then used to say, no way, Parkinson's is not genetic. Uh, and now, this was one gene in the, nine, in the 90s, we have a long list of genes, even you know, 20 genes so far. Obviously, they cause different phenotypes. Some of these genes have a very strong effect. So if you have a mutation of the gene, you will have the disease. Some others are more modifiers, or they can just increase the risk. Some of them is GBA. It's another important gene. When you have a GBA mutation, it doesn't mean that you're going to have Parkinson's for sure, but you, we know that you have an increased risk. And the same, you know, there's a variety in between, uh, also depending on the actual mutation that we're talking about. Certain GBA mutations are for sure linked to Parkinson's. Some others are less uh, linked to Parkinson's. This is a complex topic, but it's expanding very fast. Uh, another gene very popular is LAR2. Uh, up to 5% of our patients with or without family history have a mutation of LAR2. And we know what this gene does. And there are now therapies in trial specifically designed for people having a mutation of the LAR2 gene. So this is how the field is moving. Uh, so uh, I guess this is the, the shortest, believe it or not, answer to your question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a lot to cover. Um, and I know we have a lot of questions. So I, I appreciate you trying to you know, explain this complex disease in, in a short amount of time. So now, um, is there anything in our diet lifestyle or environment threatening our health and safety? I know we touched on it earlier, but let's, let's deep dive on this. Absolutely. So it seems to uh, different studies at this point have uh, emphasized that the Mediterranean diet uh, has a good impact on, on the disease. It reduces the risk probably, but even if not, when you get the disease, your disease tend to be milder. And, and this is probably because of the antioxidants in olive oil or on, in vegetables. So basically the basic of the, the Mediterranean diet. Uh, there is also a strong link between uh, resistance to insulin and Parkinson's. Um, and so, you know, diabetes is 
expanding. A lot of people now have diabetes, diabetes, type 2 diabetes. And not surprisingly, there are now trials using diabetes medications for Parkinson's. So even there, there's a connection between the nutritional state, the energetic uh, state of the brain and Parkinson's. Because the cells that they are degenerating are very sensitive to this type of insults, metabolic insults. So it makes sense that your diet will make a difference. Uh, another big one is exercising. Uh, and uh, there are studies now showing that aerobic exercise have an, in, in, an effect on the disease. Some people argue that they can also be neuroprotective. Uh, obviously, we need more studies. <clears throat> but my experience tells me that uh, if you have Parkinson's. And before you got Parkinson's, you were having a very active life with a lot of aerobic exercise, a lot of movement. Um, your Parkinson's will be more benign than the same type of disease uh, uh, that, that is affecting someone who spent uh, uh, their life sitting on a couch. Uh, so, and, and this is actually what I tell myself every morning. I say, I should exercise more because one day I'm going to have a disease mm -hmm. and it's better to be ready. And one way to be ready is to eat well, to move more. Uh, a little more controversial is the effect of coffee, cigarette smoking. So I won't cover it, uh, but there are, there, are, there are been studies also looking at it. And there are also studying, giving, studies giving caffeine uh, or nicotine patch to patients to see what happens. And I'm just mentioning so that people understand why these type of studies have been done. Mm -hmm. I concur with you. You know, in the back of my mind, I'm telling myself that live as if you're going to have something in the future. So make these choices every day. Like I ask myself, what can you do today? Just the things that you mentioned, you know, proper diet, exercise, sleep, reducing stress, and so forth, right? And yeah. let me tell you, it resets my attitude right away. <laughs> you know, when I'm in this mode that maybe you don't want to do anything, but um, it helps. It, it helps you get motivated to take ownership of your future. So thank Absolutely. you. Yeah. Now, for those of you in the audience, um, we love it that you you share your thoughts and comments. And, you know, thank you for being here. So I'm going to acknowledge any further comments. Um, one, one thing I saw is that people are asking about the support group I was talking about, the PD Avenger. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a group of superhero, uh, Parkinson's patients, superhero, uh, helping each other, helping others, and uh, open to any sort of participation from, from, from others, I'm sure. I know some of them, and they're exceptional people. Um, so PD Avengers, check them out. Um, but you, know, you can uh, also ask your doctor. Maybe the other important uh, um, uh, piece of information for people here is to make sure that your doctor is a Parkinson's specialist. Um, and that's the other problem. There are countries where there are one or two neurologists, and obviously they need to do everything. But in Western countries, um, you know, fortunately we have sub-specialties. Sub so there are certain neurologists devoted to Parkinson's. We call them movement disorders specialists. So make sure your doctor is one of them. And by that, you can simply ask them, is there any resource for me? Is there any support group I can tap into? I can, or I can reach out and, and they will know. Okay. Oh, hello, Alberto. How are you? <laughs> I love this interview with Professor Fasano. He is one of the brightest minds in neurology, and I'm always I always learn from him. Thank you, Han, for having him. Oh, we love you too, Alberto. Uh, yes. Yeah, uh, we Alberto, love you too. Alberto is a dear friend, and is too kind as always. But uh, since we are live, I won't say much. Uh, of, uh, <laughs> Because I know so much about him, and he knows so much about me, too. I see. Well, we're looking forward to having you back, Alberto. Okay, so the next topic is huge. Caregivers. Do you have any advice for caregivers dealing with the uh, emotional toll of Parkinson's? Yeah. Besides the obvious um, advice of connecting and uh, seek information, um, I, I think an advice I end up uh, giving often now is to make sure that they have some time for themselves. A caregiver doesn't have to be 24 seven with the person needing help. Uh, caregiver needs uh, time off uh, to release the pressure, to enjoy life, to have fun, which doesn't mean that this can't be done with the person with the problem, 
But sometimes a little, bit, a little bit of time alone is needed. It's needed in any context, not just when you're dealing with a disease. Um, and I noticed that sometimes caregivers have this sense of guilt that if they go for a vacation alone, it's bad. Not at all. Um, one important uh, piece of information for them all is to they need to know that it's actually shown that caregivers often have a poorer quality of life than the patient, or they actually get sick more often than the patient or other people who are not caregiving for someone. Uh, so they need to take care of themselves because they might be needed at some point in their li in, in the life of the person they're caring for. Uh, so there's no need to be attached to the other person 24 seven. There's no need to mother the person or to father the person or whatever. It's, it's good to be partner uh, in a disease. This is a complex condition, like many conditions we face nowadays in chronic uh, diseases. We're dealing with chronicity all the time. And in, the way to deal with this is to create a team, a support team. The doctor is part of the team. All the other care providers are part of the team. The patient is part of the team. The caregiver is part of the team. But it's not that we need to be stuck to, you know, to each other all the time. It's good to have some time off, some time for yourself and, uh, and uh, recharge so that you can go back and do what you're doing even better than before. So that's, I think, an important piece of information that people need to have. Mm -hmm. I agree. You know, one additional change, uh, a challenge, I mean, is sometimes when you try to get help for your loved one with Parkinson's or dementia, they're not receptive to that change. Okay, I, I know we need a team. We, we need family members. We need an outside caregiver. You know, all those uh, members are very important. But it's a challenge to get your loved one to embrace that change or a new faith. And then sometimes the caregiver, like in my case, my sister, I mean, we're concerned, is she going to go first before, you know, her loved one? So yeah. that's, it's very important. And somehow we got to integrate that relief into the day-to-day -day life of the caregiver and work on having your loved one accepting that new help. Absolutely. And uh, it, what you're doing, educating the community is very important to that. Caregiver needs not a disease. Uh, I often find that some caregivers don't understand uh, what's going on. Uh, you know, I'm telling my husband to move, but he's always on the couch, you know, moving. And he says he's uh, stuck, but then when he's here with you in the office, he moves better. That's a typical complaint. Uh, now, Parkinson's patients tend to move way better if they're in a different environment, if we are, if they're with the strangers, with a doctor, in a wider space. So, when, if at home they have stuck, they get stuck in the bathroom and they can't move. It's not because they want to piss you off. It's just because uh, the disease does that. So, education sometimes um, uh, resolve the conflict because sometimes they even argue in the clinic in front of me. So, see, you're doing well. Why do you fake your problems at home? So this is just an example. So education is key in this regard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So do you feel like the general public has, I guess, is informed enough about Parkinson's? Hmm. That's a very good question. Uh, I think uh, the education on this condition is much better than it used to be. Uh, but the problem that the internet brings is that the noise, uh, the signal to noise ratio is very low. If I type Parkinson's on Google right now, I'm bombarded with a lot of information. And I'm pretty sure that 50, 60% of them are wrong. Uh, yet there is 40% of millions of uh, records I can access to, which are spot on. Uh, so there's access to a lot of information. Perhaps what's missing is a guidance. Uh, that's why I emphasize the terms of research, placebo, control, randomized, what these things means. Because people need to know where to go, where, where to find the information. And I would say, don't just surf uh, the internet looking for answers to yourself. If you want to do that, ask for help. Uh, if you want to know what I would suggest, I would say, if you know enough biology, go on pubmed.com, which stores all the articles, all the scientific articles. And this is where you might see good information. Or go to the Michael J. Fox Foundation uh, website. Go to Parkinson's Canada website. So go where... Uh, there are usually scientific advisors so that whatever is posted is being evaluated by a team of scientists. Uh, because, like I said, you, you can find really anything on the internet. You can even find that, I don't know, onions are the best therapy for tremor. I, I just need to do a test. I can look it up right now, and I'm sure I'm going to find 10,000 things 
on onions and Parkinson's. I'm just making it up. Maybe there's nothing, but this is just an example that there is too much going on. There is a lot of um, also economical interest. Uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, company, let's call them companies, trying to steal your money, claiming any sort of benefit from therapies. And some of these companies are actually even telling you, look, we can give it to you for free just for a month. You try it, and if you like it, you can buy. And they basically take advantage of placebo effect. You use it for a month, you do great. You buy it a month later, you're not doing so great. So be careful and document yourself with making sure that there is scientific evidence um, supporting that what you're about to buy or what you're getting into has some benefit. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned some resources out there that uh, <clears throat> we all can tap into. Now, how about you and I? in the audience. How can we raise awareness for people with this neurodegenerative disease, dementia or Alzheimer's or Parkinson's? So what can we do more to bring that awareness? What you're doing <laughs> to begin with, interviewing people. Um, I would suggest uh, that you also interview, I don't know, maybe you've done it, uh, uh, patients and caregiver. Um, so that uh, people get to the sense that we are all facing the same issues. You know, human beings are the same. It's impressive how similar our needs and fears are, regardless of where you are. You know, I've been seeing patients pretty much everywhere in the world. You know, sometimes we travel for conferences, and the questions are always the same. So, uh, what you're doing right now, interviewing me and Professor Spey and whoever, uh, is great and helps and helps a great deal. Uh, I, I've been um, uh, searching on the internet and see your website, your page on LinkedIn, and uh, this is all, all you're doing is great. And like yourself, there are other people uh, trying to educate the community out there using the internet. And these are all uh, great efforts in trying to fill this gap between the doctor that knows everything and the patient with just an object. Now, the reality is that doctors very often know very little, and we should be better at acknowledging our ignorance and patients actually know a lot uh, some of them are actually scientists themselves or in any case they deal with the disease so we have a lot to learn from them so um, to your question i think we need to have more common ground more more uh, shared information more ways to get together um, and uh, uh, without any hierarchy uh, we are mm -hmm. all uh, in this together and and, uh, and and we can learn from each other Mm -hmm. I, I appreciate you said that without hierarchy, right? Yeah. Sometimes it's misperceived to be one talking down or directing and so forth. But we all are at risk in my mind. So, yeah, Of course. <laughs> do you do you have a little bit more time that we can acknowledge more folks um, sure, on the sure. chat? L let's go yeah. through them. I know we're at the tail end, but let's acknowledge some more. Which one you want to take here or... Uh, so, well, let's start from Christopher. Oh, Christopher is a, uh, it's a Twitter friend and uh, we've been changing some ideas in the past. Uh, superfoods and other psycho scientific cures you find online. Well, yeah, let's start with vitamin B1. Uh, there was at some point a lot of hype around the use of vitamin B1 uh, claimed to be the cure of Parkinson's. Nothing can be the cure of Parkinson's. If someone tells you, we have the cure of Parkinson's is, is, is wrong. They may tell you we have sunny that slow the disease progression. If you have this mutation, if your Parkinson's is A, B, and, and C, uh, there's no, as you said at the beginning of this interview, there's no one size fits all. Um, so any claim of this type is, is, is absolutely wrong. And that helps you understand uh, where you're talking about sunny that has no scientific uh, validity uh superfoods same stuff you know we just need to have a balanced mediterranean or mediterranean ish diet uh you know I, it's one of the things i miss the most being in canada <laughs> and that's the reason why i go to italy every once in a while but you know you can uh, you can do a good job just uh, starting from what you buy when you go to the grocery store um one problem that um, uh, parkinson's patients have when they're on drugs is they they can't say no i call it the, the cherry effect when you have a cherry then you want to have another one then another one so if at home you have any sort of junk food you eat it all if you don't have it you won't eat it so sometimes a good strategy to have a good diet starts from what you buy at the grocery store and some some of my patients say well but what about my kids they won't have this and then i don't sometimes i come up with ideas like you know use a different fridge, use a lock, do something, but don't let them see it. 
Um, Larry Linton is saying that this topic is very relevant to the young onset Parkinson's disease. Ch changing roles, changing relationships are the extra burdens we face, absolutely. Um, the impact of the disease on the economical income, on the uh, partnership, really the going out for dinner, seeing friends, sex life, uh, having a significant others next to you, all of this is uh, not well recognized. And this is a burden that all neurological, but in general, chronic diseases have. Uh, and uh, more needs to be done in terms of uh, psychosocial support, but also in understanding that often you need to go for the strongest therapy as soon as possible. Uh, an important point here is that if your psychosocial adaptation is going down, if you're losing income, if you're not showing up to work as you used to all the time, it's not time to play with drugs or, okay, let's try this experimental therapy there. No, go straight for deep brain stimulation, go straight for a levodopa pump, do something significant uh, because it might be too late if you do later on because you might lose your job, you might lose your partner, you might lose your friends, and it's very difficult to go back. Um, a colleague of mine from Germany, Jens Folkman, once told me the story of this uh, policeman who had a very fulfilled life, very active, and he reached the level of uh, uh, you know, a certain level of disability. He waited, he waited too long maybe, uh, and I should say that his doctors more than anything, he had the one DBS and he ended up in a nursing home depressed. And when he spoke with Jens Falkman, my colleague, he said, look, I can move. I don't have any tremor anymore. I don't have any fluctuations, I don't have dyskinesias, yet I'm here in a nursing home alone and I lost all I had before. So this is what changed the approach to to, to these advanced therapies these days. Uh, let's see if there is something else. Uh, uh, thank you, Loretta, for your words. So Larry says, I've been living with, with living with PD for 10 years, and my advice is don't wait for uh, the pain or the diagnosis before leaving, focusing on your life. Uh, live like you have just got bad news today. Absolutely. Or you, you can even live without, having think, or without thinking about any bad news. Just live your life and don't worry too much about the future. I'm an anxious person myself, and sometimes I find myself thinking too much about the possible negative consequences that never happen. And in any case, I ruin my present, worrying about the future or remodulating about the past. We should all live in the present. And this is because we are gonna die. <laughs> we are gonna have a disease at some point. So Latins used to say carpe diem, which is grasp the moment. And, it, and that's so true. Mm -hmm. uh, I see that uh, uh, someone posted the, the website, uh, PD Avengers and other important websites. Uh, actually, there's also this idea uh, that women are uh, women are not enough represented, uh, and there's not much attention to them. Absolutely true. Uh, there are great women out there. With, some of them with Parkinson's. One of them is Sarah Rigier. She just published her PhD thesis talking about the impact of the disease in her life, and uh, and and she's also very interested in this uh, connection with women. Um, I mentioned already the disparities uh, in research studies where women are not enough represented sometimes. Uh, so that's another important topic, which in general taps into the topic of gender equality, which is a very important one these days. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's see. Uh, oh, yeah, Michael uh, is talking about it. He's, uh, he's living with uh, ALS and frontotemporal dementia. Yes, so these are other diseases uh, with a huge impact uh possibly even more than parkinson's because they don't have an effective symptomatic therapy at least for parkinson's we have something that cannot make an impact on on the symptoms for ls and fdd there is nothing and uh and and actually i always say uh that uh, obviously donation for research is always important but when i personally donate money i usually donate money for als research because it's really the one that has no uh, uh symptomatic therapy so life for people with less is not the greatest, as we know. Uh, interestingly, there are new developments. Uh, re recently, there have been you know, new drugs, there's new understanding uh, on the mechanism of the disease. Uh, I don't see you anymore. I don't know if you're still there, uh, but I think we covered all the questions. Okay, there you are. Yeah, I see you. Go ahead, continue. No, I, I was just saying that uh, we, I think I addressed all the, the questions that I see in the chat box. Great, great, great. Gosh, thank you so much. Um, do you have anything else to add, Dr. Alfonso? 
Uh, no, I just want to thank uh, the audience uh, for being with us this morning. Uh, it's always nice to have an exchange uh, and to, you know, go home with some new ideas. And uh, today's uh, uh, conversation really made me think more about some of the things I said. And uh, it's it's good to, to, like I said already, share experience. And um, I always learn something new. So thank you all. Yes, thank you so much for the folks in the audience to be a part of this conversation. Every question that you bring up, it also makes me think. Uh, I painfully go through the journey of um, seeing my family members going through dementia and Alzheimer's and uh, Parkinson's. So I think we are all in this uh, at some point in life. And I thank you so much for uh, Dr. Alfonso to do the work that he's doing and hopefully a cure someday. So clearly, Parkinson is a disease that has a wide range of consequences for our society. While prevention is difficult, there's ways to manage the sy symptoms and live with it. Um, patients with this condition and their caregivers may benefit from support groups like Dr. Alfonso mentioned. Parkinson's has a wide range of consequences for our society. Um, from caregiver stress to hospitalization costs and our understanding of this genetics and environmental causes is gradual, elevating this to a status of diseases. So I hope that you found this conversation interesting. Um, and, and how can the guests uh, find you or follow you, Dr. Alfonso? Uh, well, I guess uh, they, they can uh, reach out to me on LinkedIn, on uh, all the many platforms where this has been posted and i did it myself so they can see my handle my name so i, I think it's easy to, to be in touch great great and make sure to subscribe to our youtube channel aging media show to get notified of new videos on a healthcare series for seniors and you also get an email reminder before the video goes live on youtube or facebook and again i appreciate uh, your time your interest and we can't wait to see you again next week